All right, welcome to Soapbox Theology. This is Pastor Gabe. I wanted to speak this week just on the idea of listening to what's true versus listening to the mob. And it's kind of sad that that's where we are now with uh, the George Floyd aftermath and the, the rioting and the looting and, and, and even beyond that, the social media engagement. Again, everyone agrees that what happened was awful. There isn't actually a lot of division there. Everyone agrees that it was awful and tragic, and everyone is, is also fully aware of police brutality and the need to, the need to reform that. And again, everyone's on board with that. But when you go the next distance of saying, you must respond to this tragedy in this way, you know, we must get rid of the police. We must, you must swear fealty to BLM. You must repeat this phrase or you're not an ally. It's all, all of this uh, kind of mob justice. You must think the way that we all do or you're not actually with us. And so there's this, this, there's an us versus them. And it's really just peer pressure. Uh, anyone can see that from the outside. It's just peer pressure. It's important to notice that every time there was a mob in the New Testament, it was always fueled by anger and rage because of a misunderstanding. And they were able to get other people on board, and so everyone is kind of just moving with the flow. When they want to arrest Paul, there's a few people that are stirring up the crowds against Paul, and they're telling them lies, you know, he, he's trying to destroy our religion, he's bringing another false god, and, and, and they weren't really listening to what he had to say. Same thing with Jesus. They were stirring up mobs against him and making up lies. They said he was going to destroy the temple, right, when he was talking about his own body. You know, he's bringing, he was, he's going to come and take away, take away uh, Rome's rule and all, all this stuff. And so just continual lies and continual mob. And an another picture of a mob is in John 8, right, when the woman caught in adultery. And, and again, all of these angry men bring this woman. They cast her down at Jesus' feet. Like, she was caught in adultery. Our law says we must do this. What do you say? And, and again, there are, whether they're actually incensed about this woman's sin, who knows? They're obviously trying to catch Jesus. But every time there's a mob depicted in the New Testament, it's not a good thing. It's that people aren't thinking. Think are, people are acting emotionally. They're going along with often lies or not the whole truth. And usually the result is, is something... It's, it's attempting to be something very sinful, something awful, something tragic. Usually trying to put someone to death. And we've seen that in real time play out around us. Right? People have been, people have been killed. Co additional cops have been killed. Um, protesters have been killed. People have been uh, mobbed. You know, the violence all around. And it's, it's not enough to just say, well, I'm really angry and what happened was terrible. Again, everyone agrees with that. But when you form a mob and then try to push something else, there's something else going on and there's truth that's not being listened to. And I think Jesus is a really good example here. When the mob comes and gets in your face and they say, you must do X, Y, and Z or else, I think Jesus gives us a great example here. You keep calm. That's a really important thing. If you look online, there's so many people saying, you must respond, you must answer, you must swear fealty, you know, and, and they're all screaming at one another. And so many of the rest of us, because we're hearing so much noise, we're like, oh, I need to respond. Oh, I need to, I need to, I need to, you know, do something on my, on my, on my social media page. I need to do something over here. And it's like, no, you don't. You can look at the situation. You can understand that it was a tragedy. You can pray for justice. But justices in those situations are not in my and your hands. They're in the court's hands. And again, as I've said a couple times now, it's being addressed. The way to further address things is through discussion, is through facts, is through looking at statistics, is through coming up with the best way to honor and serve your community. And so Jesus' first example, I think, is, is calmness in front of a storm, and that's really difficult. 
that's really difficult, especially if, you, especially if you're out in the thick of it. But if you're just on social media feeling that pressure, maybe you should get off social media for a while. Social media doesn't rule your life. It doesn't control your life. And if you feel the need that you can't move beyond something, you can't, you can't, in other words, it's stealing your peace, then that might be a sign for you to step away. That might be a sign to move on and seek God for an answer. Because usually when you're compelled to re respond in the moment, it's merely just about recruiting one more person to the mob. It's, it's not about any kind of actual solution. Solutions don't come about during rage. You know, as I've said before, the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. We're told, be angry, but don't sin. And those are very hard things to do when you're just giving into your emotion. It's hard to also be self-controlled when you're giving into emotion. And that's how we respond, and that's how we, really how we love our neighbors. Loving our neighbors is not taking away their ability to call for help from the authorities. It just isn't. Even if there's a mob screaming that it should happen, you have to stop, be calm, and think about the consequences. So what happens if someone actually is being victimized? What happens when someone actually does need help? Who do they call? Well, we haven't thought that far because we're angry. Well, maybe you should. And certainly the rest of us should be allowed to. And so there, there's, a, there's a calming aspect that we all need to bring into these kind of situations. And social media doesn't allow for that. You're expected to have an immediate response because you can. You can just type out an immediate response. You know, uh, Facebook ac asks you, what's on your mind today, right? What, what do you want to share with other people? What do you want to broad broadcast to the world? Maybe, maybe you shouldn't. <laughs> maybe you should pause and really consider before you say anything. Maybe you ought to step back. Cool, let cooler heads prevail. See, the Word of God is all about calling you and I to consider what's in our own hearts and in our own lives. It's rarely calling us to go outside and solve the world's problems. The Word of God is more calling you and I to fix our problems so that we are, better, we are more poised to actually help others. You know, it says, take the speck out of your own eye before you go and try to address uh, sorry, take the log <laughs> out of your own eye before you go and address the speck. In other words, and we're, that's not what we're about. We're all about the other, the logs in other people's lives. We're all about the injustice out in the streets. And we haven't considered what's in our own heart, what's in our own lives. You know, this is what Jordan Peterson says, right? Clean up your room first before you solve all of the world's problems. If people were focusing on their own issues, there wouldn't be so many problems out there. But that's that doesn't sound good, right? That doesn't sound like we're moving. That doesn't sound like it will bring about change. But that actually will bring about change. And in, in this, in the parable in John 8, in the story, when they keep pressing him, keep pressing him, he says, let he, you who is without sin throw the first stone. That's quite a message to our world that's burning itself down right now that wants to set up communities in Seattle of autonomous states. Let you who is without sin throw the first stone. Again, we aren't interested. We're not interested in self-reflection. We're not interested in what I might be causing, how I might be contributing, how I might be. See, we think we are because we're saying you need to recognize your privilege, you need to, and we're, we're finger pointing, right? If that person would just look, and if that person, like, it's like, no, we, the only finger we need to be pointing is at ourselves. If you're busy like this, you're not helping. You're spreading animosity. And you're accusing people of things that, frankly, they're probably not even guilty of. People are looking around, they're worried, and they're trying to figure out how to respond. What we need to do is go to the Word of God. Consider in our own lives. How can I change? How can I grow? How can I, how can I ha better have discussions with people? How can I be a better listener? Galatians 6, 1 says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you be tempted. 
bear one another's burdens. Absolutely, right? Absolutely, and fulfill the law of Christ. Have those conversations. Love on one another. But, verse 3, if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Right now, everyone thinks that they have the solution and someone else has, has the problem and it just needs to be pointed out, right? The Word of God is constantly calling us to self-reflection, not blame-shifting. And there's a lot of things to address, but we can better address those calmly if, we've, if, if, if we're first looking at ourselves. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. And that's the question. Can you really boast in yourself? Are you really doing great? Have you really got racism all figured out? Have you really, are you really the best person to be screaming at one another? Are you really qualified to throw that brick? Is your life so perfect that you're, you've allowed to be judge, jury, and executioner? It's like, no. We're not. We're not at all. Verse 5, for each one will have to bear his load. We are called to try to bear one another's burdens, but ultimately we have to, we're going to answer for our own sins, for our own transgressions. And so we need to consider that. It's so easy to blame. It is so easy to blame. But the teachings of Christ is not to blame. It's about you and I individually repenting. I, me, repenting. You, repenting. But me not telling you for, I don't know what your thing is, right? You don't know what my thing is. And we don't know what each other's things are. And so we need to be individually going before the mercy seat of God and asking for help. You know, the very premise of the new covenant when it's given in Jeremiah 31 is, is God telling that every single person will die for his own iniquity. This is Jeremiah 31, 30. Each man uh, who eats sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. There was a proverb that was going on. The grandparents have eaten sour grapes and the kids' teeth are set on edge. Does that sound familiar? The people in our history were racist and slave owners and so now the country is forever doomed to this. Uh, God was really angry at that sort of, of teaching. Ezekiel 18 is all about it. He says, I no longer want to hear this proverb. Each man will die for his own sin. You and I are responsible for what we do. Yes, we bear one another's burdens. Yes, we mourn with those we mourn and we try to help. But at the end of the day, we need to be looking in the mirror and straightening out ourselves. Because the moment something goes wrong, if I'm willing to burn down community, I don't have it all together. If I'm willing to lash out at my brothers and sisters online, I don't have it all together, and I probably don't have a right to be speaking. So I'm encouraging all of us, <laughs> find your mirror again. Let God speak into your, into your situation. How can you actually help? And stop letting the mob put additional weights and burdens on your shoulders. That's exactly what the cross of Christ is about. You've been freed from that. And, and, if, and as you actually have individual situations and sins and things you need to address, then go do that, right? Go seek forgiveness. Go work with your brother and sister. But don't take on what the mob wants to put you. And remember how that, that story ends. The, the people are rightly ashamed. That's something else we're missing. There's no shame in America anymore. It's a bad thing if you cause someone to have shame. Well, the Word of God doesn't have a problem with bringing shame because it leads to repentance. And so she looks, she, the, the woman caught in adultery, who was caught in adultery, Jesus looks at her and, he, and she says, and he says, where have your accusers gone? Right, she needed, they, she needed someone to stand, to withstand the mob and stand as an ally. Where have they gone? Nowhere. And he says, well, neither do I condemn you. He's not sent singer to death, but he does say, go and sin no more. Even the woman, I mean, think about how unthinkable this is in our society. That woman who was just put through hell, Jesus still says to her, go and sin no more. The audacity, right? How dare he say that? Why didn't he just hug her and tell her everything was going to be all right? And she was innocent, and beautiful, and perfect. It's like, no, he still says, go and sin no more. See, he's always speaking to you and I in those kind of situations. I want to read this last, just to make this last point. 
and in Luke 13, there's this story of where Jesus is walking along with the disciples and they bring up two tragedies and they kind of like want to get his perspective. Like, God, what do you, you know, Jesus, what do you think about this? This is uh, Luke 13, 1. Now there were some present at the time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices. So Pilate, the ruler of Jerusalem at the time, had jurisdiction over Jerusalem. He had actually had people put to death while giving sacrifices. Like, that's pretty messed up. Right? They're going to church, they're worshiping, they're in the temple, they're, they're literally coming before God seeking forgiveness, like this is what they're supposed to do. And they're like, man, Jesus is probably going to be upset about those Romans, right? Doing this awful thing during worship to God, right? And what does he say? He says in verse 2, Do you think that those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? Is that what you think? Or what about the Romans, right? Were those Romans worse sinners because they did this? You'd think, well, it's like, okay, well, if you're not going to focus on them, then what about those Romans, right? He says, no, three, verse three, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you too will perish. He's putting the burden on them. And then he goes on. He, he mentions another story. Or those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? You know, do you think I'm going to give you some sort of insight about what they did to earn this? Like, no, when you see that sort of stuff happening in the world, consider your own heart. He says, five, no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you too will also perish. Jesus and the word of God is continually calling you and I to self-reflection. He didn't say, let's go start a program to have better buildings. <laughs> Right? Let's go. Let's let's go cr push a social program where no one ever gets a building um, fallen on them. Let's go protest and and raise the capital that the Romans did this. How dare they interrupt worship? It's like no. He's like he's always bringing it back to us. How can I make this situation better? How can I change it? What repentance do I need to do? And the truth is, we all need to repent. And we can have we can have. We can mourn and we can show mercy and love for our fellow man, and we absolutely should. But when it comes to actual solutions, especially in the face of the mob, pause, don't fall for that, and then go seek the Lord. Go seek the Lord about what will actually make a difference. Chances are there's something that you and I can pray about in our hearts. So thank you guys so much. Consider that. Go to the Lord in prayer. Thanks.